I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. Hotel Mars, episode N. A video that I recommend all of you to go to. This is SpaceX, and we're about to speak to the president and COO of SpaceX, Gwyn Shotwell. David Livingston is here, my colleague and co-host. Good evening to you, David. The reason I want you to go to this video is that SpaceX, in its most recent test, tested a Falcon 9, or Falcon 9R. That's a particular kind of first stage launch vehicle. They did it in their test zone in Texas. And as the rocket comes back down, and you'll hear in a moment from Gwyn what's significant about this video, what you're watching as it rises up about 1,000 feet and then comes back down again, 1,000 meters perhaps, is that there's a herd of cattle wandering by in the foreground of the picture not bothered at all by a glimpse of the future. Gwyn, a very good evening to you. Thank you for joining us. What is a Falcon Niner that it doesn't bother Texas cattle? Good evening to you. Hi, thanks so much, John. So Falcon 9 R, we refer to it quickly as Falcon Niner, is fundamentally a first stage of the Falcon 9 launch vehicle. Um, the one we're testing right now in Texas has three engines instead of nine. But what it is, is it's a test program that we are using to develop the capabilities to, for complete and rapid reuse of the first stage. So we're, we're basically lifting off from a, basically a helipad, uh, a pedestal helipad in, in, uh, in our test facility in central Texas. Uh, lifting off that pedestal, going up, this most recent test was a kilometer. Uh, and then landing on kind of the helipad just next to the, the launch pedestal. So, again, we're just testing uh, guidance, navigation, and control technologies, uh, new hardware that allow us to land uh, more uh, kind of in a tighter There are little fins spot. that pop out on top. Did I see that correctly? They were, they were balancing the rocket as it came back down again. That's correct. This most recent test had, uh, had four fins. Uh, on uh, on the first stage, and what we're doing is we're just testing technologies to see what what pr provides the best. Uh, path forward to getting that stage back rapidly and reliably. Because reusing the first stage will cut your costs considerably. Dramatically, yes. And the cattle, do we know why they're not bothered already? How many times have they seen this happen? They've seen it happen almost a dozen times, actually. Not quite that high. I think this is only the second test where we've gone up a, a kilometer. Um, but they're quite used to it, actually. We used to have uh, cows get agitated by the testing, uh, the engine testing generally in, uh, at the McGregor facility. Uh, but, you know, we're testing many engines many times a day, so they're, they're bored by it, actually. I still get very excited and enthusiastic about watching an engine test, but the cows are bored. So the space cows. David? Good evening, Gwen. How are you today? I'm good, David. How are you? I'm doing just fine. Do you have any new information, or can you shed any more lights on some of the potential issues over the weekend with that upper stage engine? Is Can you tell us any more about it? Uh, you know, it actually wasn't with the engine. We saw uh, during some pre-flight checkouts on Sunday morning uh, some issue with a thrust vector control actuator on the first stage. Um, it's likely something we could have flown through uh, during flight, but what we wanted to do was make basically just be super careful. Um, and we actually wanted to go in and check uh, the second stage actuator as well. Um, but uh, we're uh, we're just being we're just being ultra careful here. We don't want schedule pressures to to drive a launch where there can be an issue. The David and Gwyn are speaking of a SpaceX launch, commercial launch with Orbcom satellites. That's they had a commercial package on board that was scheduled Friday, Saturday, and Sunday of this past weekend, and it's rescheduled now for July. Is that cor correct, Gwyn? That's correct. Uh, the, the July 14th and 15th, I think, are the dates that we requested from the range. I don't have confirmation that we have those dates back. Uh, the range does want to go on a two-week maintenance shutdown, and we couldn't, you know, guarantee that we would be able to fly in the next few days or so. So we said, look, you shut down, you do your maintenance. We don't want to put that off. Uh, and in the meantime, we'll obviously just spend more time examining the rocket and uh, doing everything we possibly can to make sure this flight is successful. David? Uh, last night on my regular space show, I, a lot of listeners kept asking why there was uh, not going to be streaming of the Saturday and Sunday possible launches and was wondering if SpaceX is changing their live streaming policy on Falcon 9 launches. You, you know, uh, 
I don't think we're changing our plan. Uh, we were moving away from the, the the webcast format that we had before to to get to a kind of a higher tech feel, um, and we were just going to transition away. Saturday launch. I mean, even though we obviously attempted it, the weather looked like we would not be able to fly on Saturday, um, and so we thought, you know, of the one day we could take to transition, maybe we can, uh, we, maybe we can take that time and transition on that Saturday, but. Uh, Public opinion was pretty strong on that point. Strong on? They like the webcast. or They, they certainly like us to live stream. So I, I believe on Sunday we were setting up to, uh, uh, to live stream. It's not quite at production level yet, but, uh, but we were going to do something. You've got a global fan club, Gwen. You're aware of that. It's a burden, I guess, for a commercial company. You're trying <laughs> to get things done right. You've got customers. But, David, we were all coming up with interpretations why it wasn't happening. I know, but it's always best to ask Gwen because you'll you'll get the answer, and we'll find out all of our assumptions were wrong. Yeah, you know, it's it's always easy to jump to some nefarious plot um, when there's almost always for any circumstance that looks odd. Um, but but in this case, it was it was simply we were moving away from that that broadca- that specific format. Anyhow, I didn't think we were going to lift off on Saturday because of the weather. Um, Turns out, if we had ten more minutes of a window, we might have been able to lift off. Uh, it was it was that close and that tight. Um, but we were going to stream live video on Sunday. Uh, we're inside, very inside, what SpaceX is right now. Gwen, I would just want to take a moment to be fair-minded for people first coming across this. SpaceX is a commercial enterprise, and you have billions of dollars of contracts, I believe, to launch commercial satellites. That's what uh, the weekend would would have uh, would have seen. You also have contracts with NASA to reach ISS, and at this point, you're developing a man capsule. But you're primarily a money-making organization. Is that correct? <laughs> yes, that is my job to ensure that we are a money-making organization. Right. Yes. So we're not. You're not launching for space adventure. You're not launching to uh, to show that America is the best. Any of the experiences we had of NASA in the 20th century. This is to make sure that your customer Orbcom gets its satellites into orbit. Oh, there's no question about that. No, but but I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the the philanthropic roots that SpaceX had, or fundamentally that, that Elon had when he founded SpaceX. Um, of course, we want SpaceX to be a business, absolutely. Um, but really, I think the, founda- the founding uh, of SpaceX was more based on doing something tremendous for humanity, and that is to develop a, 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 reliable, and, uh, a reliable enough space transportation system where we could take humans uh, kind of beyond the borders of low Earth orbit and really explore the solar system uh, with the ultimate goal of landing people on another planet and, and establishing a, a, a town or a city. David? Peter D. Selding, who's a really well-known space journalist, recently tweeted that the CEO of Ariane Space has come out and said they plan on matching SpaceX launch prices. prices. So I don't know if you heard that or saw his tweet, but does that give you guys any thoughts? Well, uh, hopefully they do it uh, in a in a in a fair and competitive way. We we obviously love competition; it keeps us sharp. I think companies get uh, get bored, fat, and lazy when they don't have someone nipping at their heels. Um, on the other hand, obviously it can't come at the uh, at a cost to the European taxpayers. It's got to be a real price. Well, what we've seen, uh, let's summarize in general, since SpaceX was successful with the first launches and now with birthing with the ISS, is we've seen the Roscosmos program uh, completely under uh, uh, review Proton and its launch costs. They have a new rocket now, Angara, I believe. We've seen Ariana realize that they've hit limits with their ability to launch and match your prices. Orbital Sciences is in the game. In fact, you've, you've provided uh, talking points for every Everybody to look at their business plans. Is that a fair summary of what's going on, Quinn? I think so. I think all these companies are uh, evaluating how they do business uh, to uh, obviously try to stay in business. We're tough competition. A tough competition with Ross Cosmos. You're keeping your eye on them. They're keeping their eye on you. Do they have anything like your a Falcon Niner? Does anybody have anything like that? Not to my knowledge, contemporary in a contemporary sense, no. And there that testing, that's going to prove some testing in decades past, um, but uh, but no, David, no David, isn't it where we've gotten with this, and certainly no one recently. 
David, isn't it true that Falcon 9, or the expectation here, that's what's going to reduce costs dramatically, that it's going to be very difficult to compete with? Uh, it's a huge game changer when they become operational with it. Everybody is looking forward to it. It's the number one, Gwen, space show exciting story of the year. It comes up on almost every one of my programs, and people are just thrilled beyond imagination and can't wait for it to become operational. Everybody from professional speakers and guests to the space cadet enthusiasts that call in, you know, that support the show and listen to it with the guests, you've got everybody excited about this. It's uh, it's a game changer. It also is really the only way to ensure kind of round round trip uh, fare, so to speak, uh, between here and another destination. Grasshopper, Falcon 9 those are different approaches, right? Grasshopper was uh, 1.0, Falcon 9 is 2.0. Is there going to be a 3, Gwen? Um, you know, I think Falcon 9 Niner, Falcon Niner is so close to, the, to a, uh, a Falcon 9, uh, current Falcon 9 first stage. Right. Um, I think the, the modifications to Falcon 9 or the... Uh, the additional work we'll be doing there will be adding capability and technologies to test. For instance, you know, we did the, the landing leg test, um, not in the last test, but, well, obviously we did in the last test, but in the test before was the first time we tried that technology, and then most recently we did the fins, as you mentioned early in the show. So I think you'll keep seeing us testing out and demonstrating different technologies just to come up with the best set or the best suite of capabilities in order to bring that first stage back reliably, safely. On land. Gwen Shotwell is president and COO of SpaceX. David Livingston, Dr. Space himself of the Space Show. I'm John Batchelor. Hotel Mars episode ends.